Fine. Awesome. So, what I want to talk to you about today is uh, the basically how we regulate our torment. And for those of you uh, who haven't visited this area for our stress response, so the major central organizer of the stress response is your paraventricular nucleus and the hypothalamus. So your hypothalamus secretes a peptide called corticotrophin releasing hormone, which acts on the pituitary gland. Your pituitary gland then makes ACTH, which goes around the circulation to the adrenal glands. And then it acts on the adrenal glands to secrete cortisol. And then cortisol goes and has multiple effects in the body, including back on the brain itself. Now, the really weird thing in a way about cortisol is it's one single hormone, but it acts on multiple different systems. So the HPA axis is absolutely life critical. It's the only hormonal system you have that you absolutely need for life. So it's a critical homeostatic system and it's critical for your cognitive function, cardiovascular function, metabolic and immune function. But as well as being important for all of those systems, there are all other things that it has to do. It has to be able to anticipate events. People think of cortisol as a stress hormone. In fact, it, it, it's a hormone that anticipates stress. It needs to go up before your stress to get you ready for stress. It needs to be sensitive and it needs to respond to stresses. It needs to be robust so it can preserve its dynamic behavior even during perturbations. And it needs to be able to show plasticity so that it can adapt to new circumstances. So there are multiple different things in different systems that one single hormone has to do. And there obviously need to be multiple local regulatory mechanisms to allow it to be able to do that. So the first thing I want to talk about is how can your HBA axis anticipate events? Well, one of the major, the major event in all of our lives is the fact that we live on a globe which is turning around every 24 hours. That basically means that we go to sleep at night and that we wake up in the morning. And what's really important about this is that we need to be prepared for waking up in the morning. We need to get all of our body systems ready so that when we wake up, where all functions go. And the way we do this is that there's another nucleus in the hypothalamus called the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which is basically a body clock. So you have a clock actually within your hypothalamus, which then regulates the part of the hypothalamus that regulates CRH. So this body clock is the regulator, and basically it tells you before you wake up that you're going to wake up to get you ready for waking up. Now, if the suprachiasmatic nucleus was the only thing that regulated your HPA activity, what you would expect is this. You would expect late at night to have low levels, then early in the morning before you wake up, you peak, and then you'll come back slowly down during the rest of the day. But actually, if you look at individuals, what you actually find is different. It is low at night, certainly. But before you wake in the morning, you get these huge pulses of cortisol which then continue throughout the rest of the 24 hours and then decrease again at night. And you find this in all mammals that have been looked at. So obviously uh, in a rodent, a rodent is optional. And so the pulse is even before rodent has its active phase. In humans, humans are diurnal. We wake up uh, in the mornings. And basically it pulse starts, you get these pulses before you wake up in the morning. So this is, showing you the ability of the HPA axis to anticipate your needs. And this is conserved, highly conserved across all species. What happens during stress? As I said, it's got to be, these responses have to be able to adapt to whatever's going on in your life. So what happens during stress? Believe it or not, stressing humans is actually quite difficult. Uh, and the, the stress that we used was cardiac surgery. And so, uh, these weren't volunteers, obviously these were patients who were coming in for, for cardiac surgery. And so they had cardiac surgery at this time. And after cardiac surgery, this is a mean of 20 people. You have this huge response of cortisol. 
Now, classically, you'd look at that and think, wow, over 24 hours, there's a large HPA response. But actually, when you mean data from lots of animals or from lots of people, you actually lose the message. Because what actually happens in any one individual is this. You have cardiac surgery, then you have a peak of ACTH here in red, and then you have these peaks of cortisol, these huge, these are massive peaks, which continue well on beyond this is 24 hours here. So you've got this, this pulsatility of the HP axis is a very intrinsic mechanism, which is highly conserved and even continues during situations of maximal stress. So the question then for us was, what is it that actually, what, what is it that actually causes this pulsatility? Now, I don't want, I haven't got time to go through this with you, but we did a series of mathem mathematical modeling and biological testing. And actually what happens is this, although your daily rhythms are regulated by your hypothalamus, there is no pulsatility encoded in your hypothalamus at all. Well, what actually happens is, that ACTH is released by your hypothalamus, by your pituitary, and it acts on the adrenal gland. Now, the strange thing, or the different thing about cortisol, is it's a very lipophilic hormone. And that means it can't be stored in vesicles. So you can't have a store of cortisol to be released when ACTH hits the adrenal. So when that makes the adrenal, the adrenal actually has to synthesize new cortisol, it synthesizes the cortisol, then it goes around the body and it turns off the pituitary gland. So what you have here is a feed forward and a feedback system with a delay in it. And mathematically, any feed forward feedback system with a delay in it has to oscillate the pituitary and the adrenal gland. We can actually show this by looking, uh, uh, by looking at uh, the uh, rat at a time when it's producing no corticosterone, well, rats make corticosterone, so they make no corticosterone at all. So if you look in the daytime in the rats, the rats aren't making any CRH at all. So at this period of time, they're not making any CRH. So what we do is we infuse a constant infusion of CRH. So there are no pulses here, there's a constant infusion of CRH, and with this constant infusion of CRH acting on the pituitary, we get these beautiful hourly pulses of corticosterone and indeed of ACTH. So you have a sub-hypothalamic oscillator, which evolved, which comes purely as, an, as, as a function of the interaction between the pituitary and the adrenal gland. So in humans, what you get is this. At nighttime, there's nothing going on at all. Then at about three in the morning, you start producing CRH. Uh, the CRH then goes to the pituitary. The pituitary releases ACTH. ACTH acts on the adrenal. So there's a delay. Then the delay, the adrenal makes cortisol. It feeds back on the pituitary. It turns the pituitary off. And then when the cortisol drops, the pituitary continues again. So you have constant, despite constant hypothalamic stimulation, you have pulsatility because of the interaction between the pituitary and the adrenal. So if you've got this, it basically means that you have got pulses of cortisol going around the body all of the time. And so then the next question is, if your body is always seeing pulses of cortisol, has it adapted to seeing these pulses? So basically, uh, what we did was we looked at the signaling of cortisol. So when cortisol gets into the tissues, as I say, it's lipophilic, so it gets into cells, it gets into the cytoplasm, and it has two different receptors. It has the glucocorticoid receptor, the GR, which is ubiquitous in almost, almost all of the body, and there's the mineralocorticoid receptor, MR, which is present in quite a lar large amount of the brain, but not all of the brain. So cortisol gets into the cytoplasm, it binds to GI and MR, these then dimerize, they go into the nucleus, and they bind to glucocorticoid response elements, and they initiate transcription. What we can do is we can label the glucocorticoid receptor and the mineralocorticoid receptor uh, with green fluorescent protein 
or, or with, a, with a red protein so we can actually see them. We can actually demonstrate what's happening. So this is in a cell line uh, which has an artificial promoter which has about 2,000 glucocorticoid response elements all next to each other. So on the DNA, you've got lots and lots of receptors for uh, glucocorticoid receptor. So what the design of the study is this. There's no, there's no corticosteroid in the medium. We put it in, we wash it off, we put it in, we wash it off, we put it in, and we wash it off. So before we put it in, you'll see that all the glucocorticoid receptor, which is green, is all in the cytoplasm. We put the first pulse of cortisol on, and you can see it all goes into the nucleus, which is green, but you can also see it actually binding to the DNA here, because this is where we've got these 2,000 GREs all next to each other. Then we wash off the corticosterone. We can see the GR remains in the nucleus comes off the DNA. Another pulse, it binds again, wash it, it comes off. Another pulse, it goes on again. So you can see pulsatile binding of the glucocorticoid receptor to the DNA. Mineralocorticoid receptor, interestingly, is slightly different. So to remind you with the GR, GR green here, we put on a pulse, it goes into the nucleus, it binds to the GREs and then washes off. The glucocorticoid receptor, the mineralocorticoid receptor is in the cytoplasm. We put corticosterone on, it goes into the nucleus, it binds to the same GREs, but it doesn't wash off. In fact, it takes over an hour to wash off. So the dynamics of binding to the DNA of these two receptors is different. And as you can imagine, if that's the case, then depending on the frequency of the pulsatility, you will have differential activation of these two receptors. So basically what we've got, and this is work of Becky Conroy Campbell, we have pulses of cortisol in humans or corticosterone in the rat. At the peak of each pulse, we have glucocorticoid receptor and a mineralocorticoid receptor binding to the DNA. And at the nadi area of each of the pulse, the glucocorticoid receptor comes off, the MR remains on for a prolonged period of time. So what does this matter? Is this interesting? Is this, is this of any relevance? So I'm going to look with, with you now at both the importance of both circadian rhythms and of ultradian rhythms. And I'm going to, I'm not going to talk about metabolic function because this is a neuroscience community, uh, but I'm going to talk about cognitive function and I'm going to look in the rodent uh, and in man. So first in the rodent, and you will, and this is work of uh, Matt Clayton working with Zuna Bartolotto. Uh, basically, you will all be aware of LTP. And basically, this is uh, done uh, at ZT12. So this is at a time, this is 12 hours after lights on. So it's basically when the animal is going into the dark, when the animal is active, and you'll see you have you, the high frequency stimulation and you record in the hippocampus and you get this beautiful LTP. But, and I think this is a really important message for a lot of neuroscience scientists who do this type of work. If you look at ZT0, so basically this is when, uh, this is just when the lights uh, are coming on, so this is when the rodents are going to sleep. There's no LTP. The LTP is completely dependent upon the time of day. Uh, you have it during the time of activity, and you don't have it uh, during the time when you're asleep. And I think we can all sort of sympathize with this, you know, when you're woken up in three in the morning and somebody gives you a nasty mathematical question, you're probably not quite so good as, a, as you are uh, in the middle of the morning. So basically, there is a major difference during the day, different parts of the day, in the way uh, your electrophysiology uh, of your CA1 neurons in the hippocampus is working. So we were interesting about whether or not this depended upon the steroids in the blood. So what we then did was we gave these rats the smallest dose of methylprednisolone possible, which would suppress their HP acid, their HP axis. Now methylprednisolone is a synthetic steroid uh, and it has quite a long plasma half-life. 
we put it in the drinking water and basically they stop making any corticosterone of their own and they have a constant so they have a loss of both their circadian and their ultradian rhythm uh, of corticosterone and when we do this you'll see both at zt0 and at zt12 there is a complete loss of their ltp so basically when you, we give them steroids we are having a major effect on LTP uh, in the hippocampus. The next question, of course, was, does this actually affect their memory? Uh, and so uh, basically Matt Burney uh, with Gareth, uh, Gareth Barker uh, and Claire Warburton uh, did the simple study. Well, I say it's a simple study. I think all behavioral studies are incredibly difficult. You have a space in which you put your rats, and then you put into the space two objects. You let the rat, rats explore, explore these two objects. You take the rats out of the cage, and then you move one of the objects, and you put the rats back in the cage. Now, rats like novelty, they like seeing something that's new, something that's different. So the first time they go into the cage, they see two new objects, they will explore them the same amount of time. You take them out and you move one of them, they come back in, they will remember that object, so they won't be so interested in it. This one has moved, so they will spend much more time with this one. So it's a measure of hippocampal memory, it's a measure of, of them remembering where the, the, this one was somewhere else before, and this one has moved. So we can do this, and when, when we do this study, and first of all, I just want to show you in blue the normal animals. And what I'm looking at is the discrimination ratio. So basically, if they look at the moved object more, they will have a positive discrimination towards this subject. And so when we've taken them out of the cage, uh, we move one of the objects and they come back. They will, they discriminate, they look at the newly moved objects. If you take them out of the cage, for one hour, they will recognize when they go back in that one of the objects has moved. At six hours, likewise, they will remember and they will see that one of them has moved, so they discriminate and look at the object that's been moved. And even at 24 hours, uh, they will be able to discriminate between the two objects. But in the animals that were given methylprednisolone, if you take them out of the cage, move the object and bring them back in an hour later, they can discriminate. They can see that one of them has been moved. But by six hours, they are totally unaware. They don't discriminate between the two objects at all. And similarly, at 24 hours. So basically, putting them on this constant corticosterone, in which they have no circadian or ultradian rhythmicity of their cortisol, uh, they lose their uh, ability to remember where this object has moved. So why is this? Uh, you know, what, what's happened? Why, why, can't they, why can't they remember this? So the first thing to think is, well, we know that uh, at different times of day, uh, animals uh, remember differently. So maybe, maybe your body clock in the suprachiasmatic nucleus, maybe your glucocorticoids have affected the body clock and basically damped the body clock down so that it no longer knows the time of day and basically uh, uh, basically you don't remember at any time of day rather than remembering really well when your cortisol goes up in the morning. So the first thing we did was we looked at the body clock. Now there is evidence that this is the only part of the whole body that doesn't have glucocorticoid receptors. So uh, it, it's not definitive evidence, but there's strong evidence that this is the only place in the whole body without glucocorticoid receptors. So we looked at this, and basically this is the suprachiasmatic nucleus above the optic chiasm. The optic chiasm is here, and these, this is the suprachiasmatic nucleus. And we add, these are the areas that we analyzed. And we looked at day and night. And in the, <clears throat> in the normal animals, in blue, you can see that the clock gene period one, there's a huge difference between uh, day and night. And you can see period two, which is regulated the opposite way around. You can see a huge difference between day and night. And vasopressin, which is another gene which is turned on in a circadian manner in the SCM, 
is basically turned on in a circadian manner here. But the animals that were given glucocorticoids, given glucocorticoids have totally normal period one, totally normal period two, and totally normal vasopressin. So it does appear that your suprachiasmatic nucleus isn't affected at all. So if your suprachiasmatic nucleus isn't affected by steroids, uh, what's going on? So we wanted to check on it. We wanted to check on other end points of the suprachiasmatic nucleus. If you damage the suprachiasmatic nucleus, the animals lose their circadian locomotor activity and their, their uh, daily body temperature change. So the normal animals, you can see, have this lovely circadian change in locomotor activity here and their body temperature, likewise, they have this lovely circadian change in body temperature. Uh, the animals that were given glucocorticoids were identical. There was no difference. So again, there's no evidence that the glucocorticoids are actually affecting your suprachiasmatic nucleus. Well, what about the hippocampus itself? itself? So basically we did a, a, a whole genome a measure of differential uh, gene expression across the whole 24 hours. And you'll see that looking, this is in the whole hippocampus, looking across the whole 24 hours, you'll see this is just a heat map. There's major differences in the genes expressed at different times of the day. And in the animals that were given glucocorticoids, there were also major differences across the 24 hours. So we know there are differences. But when we look at the peak expression of these differentially exp uh, expressed genes, you'll see that uh, in the normal animals, the normal animals which were just on ordinary, ordinary drinking water, their differentially expressed genes peak that's about six hours after lights on, whereas the ones that are given glucocorticoids, their differentially expressed genes peak at a totally different time of the day. They peak just uh, at the end of the dark phase. So giving them these glucocorticoids has had a major effect on the timing of a large number of genes in the hippocampus. And I don't want to go through these in detail because this will just bore you, but uh, so blue is the normal animals and green is the animals given glucocorticoids. These are a series of clock genes and they have been majorly affected by, give, by giving them uh, glucocorticoids. These are known glucocorticoid responsive genes and these have changed hugely by giving them glucocorticoids. And these are just some synaptic regulatory genes, uh, CAM kinase, CAM kinase 2A, 2D, GRIN 2A, GRIN 2B and GRIN 2C, all of which the timing of the expression of these genes is markedly effect, if affected by giving them the glucocorticoids. So what about humans? Well, obviously uh, it's difficult getting uh, human volunteers for biopsies of the hippocampus. So we can't do quite the, the same type of studies uh, in humans, but uh, Konstantinos Kalafatakis and Georgina Russell did some really neat studies in which Basically, we stopped people's normal adrenal activity by giving them a terraphone, which basically blocks the adrenals. And then we replaced them either with a smooth level of glucocorticoids, which peaked just after they woke in the morning and went down during the day, or we gave them exactly the same amount of glucocorticoids, but we gave them in a more physiological pattern of these great big pulses, which were at night and decreasing pulses over the rest of the day. So we did this to them and we looked at how these subjects responded. So, so what we're comparing here is the subjects giving this smooth, uh, this smooth uh, infusion, whoops, sorry, this smooth infusion of cortisol against animals, uh, humans given the same amount of cortisol but in pulses. First of all, sleep quality was much better in the subjects given the pulse tile infusion. And then we looked at me measures of working memory performance. When we gave them a low demand, really quite an easy task to do, both the subjects with a smooth infusion and the pulse tile infusion did well. But when we gave them a more demanding type of memory performance, the patients, the subjects given the pulse tile infusion did very well, but the ones given the smooth infusion did much worse. So it was important for sleep quality and it was important 
for memory and performance. I'm actually much more interested uh, in the emotional state because looking after patients who need hormone cortisol replacement therapy, uh, they do complain quite often of poor memory, but they're, 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 there's much more problem of apathy of just not wanting to do things. They tend to be unemployed. They have no interest in doing things. And so we looked at their uh, uh, attentional bias. And basically normal people, if you give them unhappy faces and happy faces, you tend to look at the happy faces. That's what you want to do. And so the patients given the smooth infusion actually looked at the fearful faces and happy faces the same amount of times, whereas the uh, subjects who were given the pulsar infusion looked at happy faces much more than fearful faces. And we also did fMRI scans on them, and I don't want to go to this in detail, but the connectivity between the amygdala uh, and the insula was markedly greater in the people given the pulse style infusion. And we know that this pathway is very active in people when there's uncertainty in identifying emotional valence. All I want to get across to you is not really the details of this, but we're giving the same amount of cortisol to these two groups of people. And both their memories and their emotional state is, by objective studies, is different. So the pattern of cortisol, rather than the amount of cortisol, is important in the way their brain interprets the signal they're getting from their circulating cortisol. And now I just wanted to bring in something completely different, just to make you think more about the importance of time of day. Uh, and this is it. You'll be uh, aware uh, that uh, of, that ketamine uh, is being increasingly used and thought of as being very important as an antidepressant. And ketamine has. I don't 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 try and read this. Uh, ketamine has all sorts of effects on the glutamate system, opioid receptors, norepinephrine, dopamine, on multiple receptor types, and. All I want to show you is one of the things uh, that ketamine does is that it actually activates the release of glucocorticoids. And I'm showing you three different doses here. That's five milligrams, 10 milligrams, and 15 milligrams. That's the 24 hours. This is just blown up over the time that the ketamine was given. And you'll see that there's a very small effect on, on corticosterone. And really, there's no dose response effect at all. And this was ketamine giving during the active period. So this was in the dark for rats it's when, when rats were active. But if we gave the same dose of ketamine during the inactive period, when, they're, when they're, uh, the animals are basically asleep during the light period, you'll see much bigger responses. And it's a dose response. You'll see 5, 15, uh, and 25 milligrams of ketamine of a milligram per kilogram of ketamine, you'll see this huge dose response here. And I just want to look at this bit here. This basically is showing you the cortisol response above baseline and comparing the inactive phase with the active phase. And you'll see the active phase has really very little response. And during the inactive phase, there is a huge response. And all I really want to get across here is the time of day in which you do your experiments, whatever your experiments might be, are critically important. And I suspect a lot of the differences in the literature in lots of different studies from different labs may well be because studies are being performed at different times of day. So that's just something to think of. That was just a just little add-on that I thought you might find interesting. Now, one of the things that has really concerned me for many years is how we can access, assess hypothalamic pituitary adrenal activity in subjects going about their normal lives. Normally when we get patients, they come in uh, and basically we bring them into hospital, we stick, uh, we stick uh, lines into, into the blood vessels, take blood samples, we stress them out. If we bring them, want to do multiple samples, we have to bring them into a hospital, they don't sleep. Uh, and basically it's very unphysiological. But what I've always wanted to do is to be able to assess HPA activity in people at home going about their normal lives, because that's what we want to know, whether they are normal 
when they do their normal things. So what we have done is we've developed a simple system in which basically we have a very small little system which can infuse saline just under the skin. And then the saline comes up and we collect it and we can collect time samples and we can collect it over 24 hours. This can be popped onto somebody in about 20 minutes. Uh, they go home, come back 24 hours later, and you get 20, uh, 72 samples over the 24 hours of the patient doing whatever it is that they normally, what they normally do. And I just want to show you, I'm not going to go through this and go into detail, the sort of thing that we can do. And this actually is coming out in the next two weeks in Science Translational Medicine. Uh, we can look at basically all of their corticosteroids I'm sure you're not going to be interested in the endocrinology of this, uh, but there are multiple steroids and they have different circadian rhythms. And you can see this is cortisol, this is cortisone. Um, again, I'm sure you're not interested in the details of this, but we can do a heat map here and uh, show you when the peak levels of each of these is in 24 hours. We can show you the nadir levels, so in blue, the darker blue is that nadir levels, and that's midnight here. And uh, we can look at their peak levels in red here. And we can look at all of these over 24 hours. And we don't, I can't, don't only have to look at steroids, of course. Uh, these are branch chain amino acids that we can look over the 24 hours. And in fact, we can look at vast numbers of different things in people going about their normal activity uh, in their normal home environment. So the messages that I wanted to get across to you are really these. that Glucocorticoids are secreted with both circadian and ultradian oscillations. Each ultradian oscillation is associated with episodic glucocorticoid receptor activation, while the mineralocorticoid receptor remains occupied between pulses. The rhythms of secretion affect clock genes, function, emotional response, and brain connectivity. And I also haven't got time to tell you this, but they also regulate TPH2 expression, and that's the uh, main regulator of serotonin uh, uh, expression in the brain, and anhedonia, as well as orexigenic and anorexigenic peptides, so it's really important in feeding behavior uh, and in mood. Time of day determines the glucocorticoid response to ketamine. It's just an example of the brain responding to different things in different ways at different times of day. And finally, uh, just to say that the new techniques of automated ambulatory hormone analysis should reveal changes in hormone dynamics associated with endocrine, inflammatory, metabolic, and psychiatric disease. And basically, there are large numbers of people uh, who I want to say thank you to, uh, but since you won't know any of these, I won't go through them in detail. And uh, thank you very much.